Welcome to Creatively Christian, a podcast by Theophany Media, where we inspire, inform, educate, and empower creative Christians of all types. I'm one of your hosts, Brandon Hollingsworth. Today on the podcast, Brandon sits down with Kimberly Jade Solomon, a professional Christian scriptwriter who is living and making a living in Hollywood. Hey, everybody out there in Theophany Media and Creatively Christian Land, this is Brandon Hollingsworth, your anchor host with the Creatively Christian Podcast, and I am here with Miss Kimberly Jade Solomon. Welcome to the show, Kimberly. Thank you so much for having me. I'm happy to be here. (laughs) Yeah, we're super stoked for you to be here, and um, being an Alabama native, I can't wait to to get to know you more, so that's great. (laughs) Awesome. Yeah, I love that connection. (laughs) All right, I'm going to introduce you to our audience because you and I have had a bit of time to get to know each other. And so I'm going to read your bio. And so everybody, drum roll. This is a great bio. So Kimberly Jade Solomon is a screenwriter living in Los Angeles for the last seven years. She is repped at APA and writes faith-based family features and has a passion for stories about people with disabilities. She's written three faith-based features for hire, and her scripts have won various awards. Congratulations, man. She was a co-writer on a grounded sci-fi feature, Tinker, starring Christian Kane and Clayne Crawford, which was on Netflix in 2019. She is currently writing a gritty faith-based short film, which is her favorite genre. She is originally from Birmingham, Alabama, and has a degree in theater from UAB. Before moving to LA, Kimberly was an equity stage manager in New York City and has worked at Carnegie Hall, Madison Square Garden, and Lincoln Center. She also interned on such Broadway shows as Wicked, Phantom of the Opera, Chitty Chitty Bang Bang, Chicago, Les Miserables, Hairspray, and The Producers, among others. Welcome. Thank you. That's a, that's a really, really awesome bio, I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah, a lot of hard work goes into it, but you try to make you know the highlights sound good. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, the highlights always do sound good. Another product of great and hard work. So so tell us a little bit about that. Tell us what, what's it like being a Christian working in LA. So tell us a little bit about that hard work. <laughs> yeah, um, I like LA. Uh, for me, it fits me more than New York City. Mm-hmm. Um, definitely glad I went there in my early 20s. You know, it's a great city when you're young and you have a lot of energy, <laughs> you know, but it's definitely an exhausting city. Um, Los Angeles is a great balance of the excitement and the busyness, but you also have a little peace and quiet. Like out my window, you can't see it, but there's a tree. So if I want to see some greenery, it's really nice. Like you can't get that in New York, you know, you see a wall. <laughs> you have to pay for all the trees that you see. Oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I don't know. You have to have a really nice place to see a tree from your window, I think. I never did, but that's okay. Um, but yeah, I love Los Angeles. And, you know, it's nice to have a, a church here that helps keep you grounded. Mm-hmm. I think without that, that might be a lot harder. Um, but yeah, I met my husband out here. I met him at church going Christmas caroling. Praise God. So That's God's great. definitely been providing. Um, so I have a life here. So it's really nice. Awesome. So t- talk a little bit, of, if you would, about the, the kind of one of the things we like to talk about on Creative the Christian is kind of that bent, you know, and understanding the bent that God puts in us as his creation and understanding at what point in your life did you did you go, okay, I want to be in theater, I want to be in entertainment, maybe even in film and movies. Talk a little bit about that discovery process, um, I'm, I'm assuming as a young person. Yeah, it's a long story, I think, okay. but I will tell you, give you the highlights. Um, I've always been a writer. You know, I always used to write like little plays. I would sit at the computer in middle school because, you know, we just had a desktop right. and I would just write plays for hours and I loved it. Um, and in high school, I started writing musicals just, you know, I wasn't great at the music part. I mean, it was okay, but you know, it was just, but the stories I loved and the Mm -hmm. characters and that sort of thing. And I always loved that. Um, I think it was like doing show choir in middle school and high school that really got me into that sort of love. I've always loved to sing. Um, Mm -hmm. and then I did musicals in high school, basically, you know, because I have a disability in my leg from birth, 
And, you know, I never let it slow me down, but I wasn't great at dancing. So what, what happened was I auditioned for Footloose and I didn't get in because I can't dance, but they asked if I wanted to do tech and run spotlight. And as soon as I did, um, I was 16 at the time I fell in love with it. So from then on, I really just focused on getting lots of tech experience in Birmingham, which is an amazing city for that. I worked at the Alabama ballet. I worked at the symphony later. I worked for the opera, but the point is there's just so much amazing arts there. So I'm really glad I lived there. And, um, you know, so I loved theater. Um, then when I was 20, got my first internship on Broadway. So I left college at that point, moved to New York for a few years, um, about three and a half years. And I was kind of finding my way, you know, I loved theater. I love stage managing because I knew that's the talent God gave me. But for a long period, I didn't write because I was so focused on getting lots of theater jobs and things like that. And then it was actually several years later that I went back to college to get my degree at UAB to finish it. And I took screenwriting. And actually, it was about 10 years ago. Um, and God really just spoke to me at that time and said, this is what you're supposed to do. You know, I didn't care about film before that, honestly, but I was at a point where I was like, what do you want for my life? God, you know, I really didn't know, um, as much as I loved theater, it was always hard to make a living, um, at it. I I was always working in theater, but just to really not be struggling was a challenge. Um, and so I just didn't know what God had for me. And, as soon as I took that class and I felt God speak to me, I was like, okay. So as soon as I graduated, I moved to Los Angeles. So. <laughs> wow. Awesome. Yeah. So, so I want to, I want to dive into a couple of things here. First, first, I want to dive into, do you feel like your experience in theater and, and understanding, you know, the intricacies of theater helped you at all once you made that decision to transition over to film? Yeah, I do think that. Um, I think, I almost wish it was translated more in some ways, but I think it helps me in ways I may not realize Mm -hmm. because I will say, you know, I I would stage manage sometimes up to a hundred cast and crew members where you're organizing it all. So I think having those skills helped me because I have done some producing. Um, I don't like to do it as much, mostly just because of the time, but I do have that skill. So it helped me, you know, assist producers too early on and get a job in an office in Hollywood, you know, Mm -hmm. I was really good at that because I had already worked in offices in Broadway. So you just kind of have that expectation of perfection, which was definitely there in New York city. And you kind of take that to Hollywood, which is also, it's a high level of performance that is expected. So I think that helps me excel um, in my first few years here, Mm -hmm. because you kind of have to work your way up, of course. Um, And then I think just being a stage manager, you're next to amazing theaters, so much you know you're literally just doing the blocking as the director is working and I don't necessarily think I want to be a director at least not in the near future but hearing all that dialogue and that pace and all my theater classes still really helped me as I write better dialogue now hopefully I I think there's something there that's more innate based on those years of experience (laughs) yeah I think uh, when you're surrounded by that excellence right and the 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 plays and the Broadway um, shows that you were a part of. I mean, they're par excellence, right? They're the top of the heap when it comes to, you know, produce theater. And so being around that and hearing them nightly, you know, that dialogue and as you said, the cadence and really the word choice and the the efficiency of those words really helps on the other side of the screen when you're typing out that dialogue for your characters to say. So yeah, I think I definitely think that's a huge, huge benefit that you had that I would love to, have, you know, I would have loved to have been a fly on the wall and learn some of that stuff as well. You, you <laughs> mentioned something about being a producer and there's, there's a big, I think there's a big um, misnomer and maybe a misunderstanding that a lot of people have about producing. So if you would tell us a little bit about what a producer does and what a producer doesn't do. So could you maybe talk about those things? Sure. And I think it's interesting because there are so many different types of producers. I think yeah. some of it I may not understand <laughs> completely. Like I have a friend who's a creative producer and all she does is kind of find an interesting novel and kind of sells it to a company to produce into a movie. Like she's not going to be on the ground doing that, but she 
is good at finding talent. So she does that. But um, in terms of producing, you know, there's a lot of, <laughs> I'm trying to think of how to unpack that, but there's independent producers. So there's people like me who I meet in LA who are like wanting to produce their film. Um, you know, I'm not the one to produce my own feature film. I've done short films. And essentially the way I look at it is if I'm doing a short film, I'm just doing all the logistics. I mean, you just have to be like schedules, you know, find locations, find actors. You just, I mean, I'm a very logistical person, so it came pretty naturally. It's like, okay, you know, what do I need to have? I need to have all this food. I need to have camera equipment. I mean, you just, I make a lot of lists and you just kind of make it happen basically. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I've assisted producers on independent features where, yeah, you're just like begging people for, do you have a car we can use? You know, we found a crane. We, someone let us use like in, right. in Birmingham, outside of Birmingham, like you just kind of make things happen which I think is hard. Um, so I don't think I'd do a feature on my own. And even right now, I don't plan on doing really a short, but I am helping produce a proof of concept for a feature that I was hired to write. So I'm just kind of helping with any logistics I can, but it's hard work. It is very yeah. hard. It takes a lot of time. Yeah, it's running <laughs> It's running down the streets of a city at three o'clock in the morning going, I have to find a pocket watch. I have to find a pocket watch. <laughs> We've got to find a pocket watch. <laughs> and so I think Absolutely. there's this really big mis misnomer because, uh, you know, with, with my company, Brainy Pixel, we're entering into this space and have been in this space for a couple of years now. And people say, when when you when you tell them oh well, we're talking to a producer or we're producing a film they're like oh wow you must have millions of dollars you're like no that's that's not at all it's really more about project management is really to put it in a secular term it's about like yeah. making sure all the trains run on time everyone gets to set on time you've got cameras and costumes and everything is there and yeah it's mm -hmm. it's a, like you said it's a lot of logistic work so and actually, let me add to that, yeah. um, just from a writer perspective. So, you know, I do have an agent now, so she sends my work out to some of the bigger companies and people she knows, but she also lets me send my scripts out to the pe producers I've met over the years. And so I'm really careful of keeping, you know, a list of mm -hmm. a lot of the people I've met and I follow up with them. And I've been sending query letters as well, like over the seven years I've been here. So I have a lot of people who have read my work over, you know, over the seven years, but my point is, so I'll try to send like, you know, I'll email to them, especially the ones I know. And I'll say, Hey, you know, I have my next script. Um, this is what it's about. You know, I'm, I'm going to be doing that probably in the next month or so mm -hmm. for my newest script. I'm just like polishing it up right now. But the point is a lot of those people don't have a lot of money either, you know, right. but sometimes right. they'll read your script and they'll pass it on to a company even or another producer. Um, so it's kind of all about who, you know, mm -hmm. so sometimes it's hard because, you know, even if you get a producer who loves your script, they still may not have the money to option right. it or buy it. <laughs> yeah. I think it's not until you get into that executive producer level where money really starts getting, <laughs> getting attached. Yeah. So, from my so. experience, at least it's got to be that level for money gets involved. Or so a I studio wanna... or something. <laughs> right. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> at a studio. So I want to rewind just a little bit and I want to touch on your Southern roots uh, a little bit. And what was it like being a young lady? And I'm assuming you were, you know, out of high school, maybe into college, leaving the South and going to the big city of New York, right? What was that like? And, and did your faith help you at all with, with that decision and that journey? That's a great question. Um, yeah. Um, you know, I was always really driven, um, sometimes for my own good, as my amazing mentor professor at UAB would say, and I agree with him now because now there's evidence, but he knew it back then too. <laughs> you know, he knew I was just, I'm just like a crazy person who kind of goes after things. And so it took me a long time to finish my degree. And, but, uh, but anyway, um, it was a shock for sure. And I did have a thicker accent because I have a video of myself, like not long before I moved to, uh, uh, to New York, excuse me, I'm like in the wrong mindset, <laughs> but I'm like, I'm like, wow, I sound so Southern. But I remember taking a diction class in college actually for singing. And I remember thinking, I have to try to not have as much of a Southern accent when I get to New York. Um, and I still say y'all, like now I lean into it. I like it. I appreciate it a lot more now um, as I'm older, but at the time I definitely didn't want to sound like a, you know, a Southern hick or whatever. There's definitely a stigma sure. to Alabama, yeah. you know, and I lived in Birmingham, like in the suburbs. So I didn't like, I didn't have like 
cousins in Alabama. So like, I just didn't understand <laughs> why people were so like demeaning about it, but no, but I mean, it was, it was a culture shock, but I think in that sense, I adjusted pretty well. Um, it was challenging because my parents were not happy with my decision to, uh, do the wicked internship because I dropped out of college. My dad was a professor at Sanford gotcha. at the time. Um, so they cut me off. So they told me not to ask them for a penny, you know, that I was on my own. And so I found, you know, I understand it, you know, but it was challenging. So I was 20 years old and it's amazing how young that is. Cause that was quite a long time ago. Um, but so it was hard. So I always had to like work, you know, hundred hours a week for at least the three and a half years in New York. So I was pretty exhausted when I left New York. Um, but I mean, I definitely, I le- I leaned on God as much as I could, you know, I think, um, I, de- I was always a Christian and I always loved God and I know he was with me. I was always trying to find the right church there. I had a few different ones as m- when I had time, I didn't always have time sure. to go to church, but I was always listening to worship music and doing what I could. Uh-huh. Um, and so I think, I know God was with me for sure. Cause I think I had his favor, just the fact that I had such constant work and right. but he, and he made me that way, like really driven. So I, I believe it all worked out for a reason. Cause I'm, I'm that way here too in LA. Um, but it was the decision to go. It's funny. It's like, I, it was a very fast process because I had gotten advice from a stage manager from a national tour. Uh-huh. And she told me what to do to get the theatrical index and how to reach out to the Broadway producers. So I reached out to like all of them, which was like 40 something. And she, like a few weeks later, you know, really like two weeks later, maybe they, I got the, it's, it's a long story, but I essentially the wicked one came about and I was like, oh yeah, I'm moving to New York in two weeks. And they're like, great. <laughs> so I kind of had to just like drop everything and go. And I didn't really pray about it, but I just, it's long, I just knew it was right, I yeah. guess, at the time. Like now I would pray about it more and sure. probably get more confirmation, but I, I just felt like it was the right decision. Well, I mean, so. I, I think I think there are some times where that is absolutely what's called for. Sometimes there's not enough time to pray, and you just have to understand that God made you a certain way and he instilled certain you know qualities and properties in you. You know, a bow doesn't have to think about whether it how it's going to shoot that arrow, it just knows when you let go, it's gonna happen. And, you know, and, I, and, and I think, and I think we see that, I mean, you know, in the old Testament, you know, Joseph never doubted, right. He just, he knew he had to interpret dreams and he knew he had to work hard and serve whoever his master was. And we saw how that profit, you know, profited him and his family and all of Egypt. So I, I think, I think there's a, there's definitely a biblical parallel there. And I, and I really think that it's helpful for our listeners who, for the most part, they're, they're Christian creatives who are trying to understand their path. It's important to understand that they need to spend some time understanding who God made them to be. You know, that was work that you did a long time before that call came, right. To go to New, to go to New York. And so you had done a lot of praying and a lot of work even before that moment. And I think that helped, helped you lean into it. So. Well, that's a good point. And now that I'm older, you know, I'm much more in tune with, mm-hmm. you know, God and what he has for me. And he speaks to me clearer now. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think either way, it was all just like a great learning process of me becoming who I am really. Mm -hmm. Um, and yeah, but now it's just a lot, it's, it's easier to make faster decisions because I am more in tune with like, oh, this actually isn't the right, you know, it's more innate now, Yeah. Yeah. but either way, um, yeah, I mean, I definitely think when things are really important, I feel like God speaks really clearly in, in some way or Oh yeah. Absolutely. Because yeah, like with the me switching to screenwriting, Mm -hmm. I was an extra in a movie, Grace Unplugged, that filmed in Birmingham. Yeah, yeah. In 2012. Yep. And um, I just felt I've never really feel God speak. Okay, like now I am more in tune with that. But 10 years ago, I really didn't feel God speak as clearly, like Mm -hmm. quite specifically. And he did. And he, you know, I mean, I just to be honest, he's like, You're gonna be a screenwriter in Hollywood. And I was in my screenwriting one class because I had just gone <laughs> back to college and I was like, okay, sure, <laughs> let's do that. I so, guess all, I guess all these tests are going to go pretty well then. <laughs> I, I mean, it's been a long journey and I think I'm still working towards that in, in a lot of ways. And I think about the Bible a lot. I'm like, well, 
you know, people have to wait for things, even when God tells them what they're going to do kind of, you know, so I try to lean on that. Absolutely. Um, but I think that it will come to pass in a more real way in the future. Absolutely. Well, Well, as a screenwriter now in LA, do you get a lot of opportunity? I mean, your bio obviously highlighted some faith-based things, but do you find that most of the work that you're doing is not faith-based or is it a fair amount? You know, what's kind of the percentage? Actually, um, I think all other than the sci-fi, which was my first real writing job, Mm -hmm. which I was just one of uh, three other writers, but it was still an amazing experience um, being on set, which was really fun, which is not always the case with writers. And it was my first real thing and really only thing at this point that's been produced. So that was fantastic. It was a great foot in the door. But I would say, um, yeah, like the last, since 2016, I purposefully started writing only faith-based. You know how I write a lot on spec, of course. Right. So I would say it's either faith-based or it has light faith in it. Uh uh Um, But but that's pretty much what I've done exclusively. And so then the three features I've been paid to write, you know, those haven't been made yet. I I hope they get made. But that the first one ended right before the pandemic. So it's just been about two and a half years or so since Uh I've been writing full time. Um, those were all either faith-based, like one was a biblical story in oh, present day. The other one, like the second one was more of a lighter faith is what I would call it. Um, but then the, the last one is a very amazing miracle story based on a true story, based on a book, that sort of thing. Uh-huh. So, um, and in the short film I'm being paid to write currently, it's a 30 minute film and that's faith as well. And it awesome. also has to do with disabilities. So it is absolutely a focus of mine to either have faith or light faith. And I do have opportunities to possibly write or rewrite other things. Mm-hmm. Sometimes they don't materialize either way, but it's one of those things where now, like I have a possible one that's not faith-based, but even if it materialized to a real offer, I don't think I would take it because I just don't feel like it's what I'm supposed to do. So I think you have to make the choice too of like, you know, you can only really do like maybe two writing big writing projects a year, maybe three Uh among other small things, you know, you might start a third or, but for me, it's like finishing two large projects a year is very good, you know, like a feature and a TV show or or two features. So the point is you have to be careful of like what you pick. (laughs) Right. And do you, and do you feel, I know oftentimes, uh, you know, a lot of the advice that you'll read about or hear about uh, is that really find a niche and kind of capitalize, you know, on that niche in Hollywood and become known for writing a certain type of script, whether it's sci-fi or hard boiled or, you know, faith-based or whatever, would you, would you agree with that sentiment? And if so, has that helped you? Yes, it has absolutely helped me. I mean, there's definitely debate out there. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think, first of all, it's good to pick one thing and get really good at it, which is why I'm also not really producing I'm trying to just get better and better at writing Mm -hmm. and especially at the faith-based writing. Um, And I think from my like first faith script in 2016 to now, I have gotten better at that genre. And it's a hard genre because you don't want to be too cheesy. I like to add some grittiness, but not too gritty, of course, you know, wholesome. So it's a hard balance uh, always. But um, but I I do think it's extremely important and I think it's helped me extensively. Um, because the first two features I've been paid to write were both from networking in Los Angeles. Uh-huh. The other thing I'll say, I mean, I think writers need to be in Los Angeles. I know people are moving out for sure. I have friends leaving. Um, and there's a lot of Zoom stuff and that's amazing. But all three of my writing jobs came from either me meeting the producer or the third one was a friend of mine from LA who recommended me to the producer. And now that I have my agent, that's amazing. And, and she gets me contacts I can't reach, you know, but I can get into, I have a lot of logistical tips of how to reach people yourself, but, um, and I do, but the thing is, it's like, she has a whole nother level to it, but I also wouldn't have got her if I wasn't in Los Angeles. Cause we were assistants years ago and she moved up. She believes in my faith writing. Cause there's not a lot of faith writers at APA or at least there weren't. Um, if there's more, that's great. You know, <laughs> um, but she, but anyway, she doesn't have a faith client, um, a faith, excuse me, like a faith based, a client who focuses in faith writing. <laughs> right. Um, so for me, that helped me not only get her, but it helped me when I met these producers and I said, Oh, I'm a faith based writer. 
um, they helped, they hired me within a few weeks, the first two producers of That's meeting. Them. Sometimes that happens. I mean, I do think, yeah. you know, it's a God thing, but, um, but at the same time for me, it's only helped me to, and I think that's how I got this short film job, this 30 minute job that could lead to other things. Honestly, yeah. um, they saw me on LinkedIn, how, and I'm good at LinkedIn. That's the one social media I'm good at. And I brand myself on LinkedIn too, because I'll connect to producers and I'll say, Hey, I'm a faith-based writer. And then the people who are interested in that do connect to me. Um, but she saw, I say, faith-based writer, especially stories about disabilities. And this has both in there. Uh -huh. um, and I had actually met her briefly previously. So we had some other connections, but initially she just saw me on LinkedIn. So Awesome. Well, you, you, you gave some good and great tips there. Some really good kind of crunchy, you know, bits of information about like l utilizing LinkedIn. And you mentioned that you had some other tips about, you know, being able to connect to people. I know that probably there are people screaming at the screen right now saying, please, please, what are some tips? So do you have two or three that you could share with our audience? Maybe not your super secrets, but, you know, just some general ones that might help a new writer trying to make some connections in a really, really difficult space to make connections. So, I mean, like for better or worse, I kind of share my tips with everyone, okay, <laughs> like all great. the good ones. So I don't really have a whole lot of secret ones, which I'm happy to do. And most people don't do them, honestly. I have a lot of friends who don't do those and that's fine, but it works for me. But um, so I would say the first thing is make sure that your script is in good shape. I don't think it has to be like the most amazing script. Like, because I think you could start this process when you're an early writer. Like I probably did it, you know, like two weeks, two, excuse me, two years after I started writing like long scripts, I was already sending like queries out, for instance, which may have still been too early. I probably wasn't an amazing writer then, and I'm still working on getting, being a better writer. But, um, but I do think like, as you do this over years, you're co collecting contacts. So I guess my first uh, suggestion is anything like this, like with LinkedIn, for instance, I do recommend connecting with producers on there and branding yourself. And then if they're interested in that brand, they'll connect with you. And then you're, you know, you can message them later if you're sending out a script, for instance. Um, I haven't done it extensively, but I have worked really hard at connecting with lots of different producers over like a three-year period. So I think you just have to look at it in a long-term process you know, um, so I've been doing query letters now for like seven years and um, nothing real tangible has come from that. I've had like possible writing jobs. I've had possible options on my scripts, but some of the deals fell through for whatever reason. Um, but I still have a great network now of producers. So for query letters, I do recommend that once your script is at least decent, you know, you've done at least five rewrites, six rewrites. And if you have placed in a contest, no matter what contest, I think it does sound better. So I would recommend sending query letters. And if they join IMDb Pro, you can go on there and just start collecting emails. Mm -hmm. So I collect tons, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds, if not over a thousand emails in a Word document. And then I slowly, like one at a time, send like, dear Bob, you know. And then what you do is you start with like something, you keep it all brief. It's all like a short letter because they don't have a lot of time, but you start with the best thing. Like, you know, I would start with like, you know, I've written three features for hire or whatever, or I'll mention the Netflix one that helped me a lot early on. But you say like, I've won this contest with this script or sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself, but you could say, you know, my name is such and such, you know, I'm a faith-based writer and I'm sending out a, you know, my newest script. I've placed in this contest, blah, 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 or, mm -hmm. you know, I've been paid to write one feature or whatever it is. Then you say, here's the log line. You just do the log line, maybe like another blurb, if it's a personal story and you just say, like, let me know if you want me to read the script. So it's like hard, hard work. It takes a long time, but I recommend doing it. You know, hundred, if you send hundreds and hundreds, you'll probably get at least 10. Mm -hmm. I mean, I say that, I mean, I sometimes can get 40. Uh, reads on my scripts right. and no matter what you know it's still great because my agent's sending it out to other people too and sometimes like someone will like it and pass it on to someone but my agent already sent it to them but that's a good thing it's like okay that's okay my work's getting to them multiple ways that's 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 new for me so that was a good thing this last year right. so with my last script I had a lot of positive feedback I'm up for some awards um oh, so 
Thank, well, thank you. But my, sorry, my point was though, I've already pretty much been rejected by those 40 or 50 people. Um, sometimes I'll get like more interest and I'll have people read it. Um, and I'm hoping like whether I win the awards or not, I'm, I'm still trying to get it out there. Cause I just really love that script. It's a personal mm-hmm. script for me. It's a Christmas one about disabilities, but, um, we'll see what happens. But the point is you just have to keep going. Um, and, and I'm also just trying to trust God with that one. You know, I've kind of done a lot of legwork and we'll see what happens, but, um, but I will be sending query letters out for my next script too, alongside my agent. But what's great is over seven years, I have hundreds of producers who have either read my work or Mm -hmm. said, Hey, you know, I'm not interested, but keep in touch. You know, you just build that network and you keep the people who are responding, you know, just keep in touch with them and it works. That's the short version, but I highly recommend it. Yeah. And and there's another thing as well is that all these people potentially are talking about you, you know, at that point in time, while those scripts are going out and while they're being read and there's, you know, there's something that happens because People think Hollywood's a big, big industry and, and it is to a degree, but it's a really small group of people and they, and they cross paths a lot. And so if somebody's talking about your script and somebody else reads like, oh yeah, well, I'm reading that as well. And you know, it can, it can create little kind of reactions, but yeah. it, it sounds like, you know, number one, do the hard work, right? Learn the craft and get really good at it. And then do the hard work of, you know, networking and sending out query letters and being persistent about that, not pushy, but consistent and persistent. And then play the long game, Mm -hmm. right? Plant lots of seeds and then learn to deal with rejection. And that's kind of the one I want to jump on here is, you know, some people would hear 40 or 50 rejections and you and I, we understand we've been there and done that, but some people would hear 40 or 50 rejections. They're like, Whoa, what are you talking about? I couldn't handle that. So Talk a little bit about handling rejection, especially as a believer in this mm-hmm. industry. How do you how do you go about that? Yeah, that's a good point. Well, I think um, the things that are in your control. The positive thing is, as you're like sending these scripts out, it can take months to really hear the rejection, and sometimes you just don't hear back. I mean, I'll check in with them, but eventually you just don't want to bug them, like you said. So sometimes the rejection in Hollywood is just you don't hear back, but that's fine too. So you eventually accept that. But there are times when they do email you and say, you know, we liked it or it's just not for us. Usually you don't get a real reason. Um, You know, sometimes it's just like it was, you know, they just give like a blanket answer or. But um, but the point is, though, think about if you have 40 people reading your script, which honestly, most of my friends do not because they don't do this. You know, so let's say you, you have, you meet someone and they want to read your script and let's say you email someone else and they want to read your script. That's two, you know? So, I mean, chances are pretty, you just have to think of it as like a numbers game. So like, if you get those two rejections, yeah, that's hard, but you only had two, but if you have like 40 people reading your script, it's exciting as well when Mm -hmm. you have that many. Um, and some, you know, and then at, if maybe you get a rejection, but you're still emailing other producers, I mean, really other than the fact that sometimes I pray about it and I'm like, okay, well, I feel like it's just time to just move on and keep writing my other projects. Cause you don't want to like do so many emails. You're not writing at all then, but if you want to, you could just go find more emails and email more producers <laughs> if you still want to get it out there, you know? Yeah. So, I mean, there's always some stuff you can do with that. Um, but there are bigger people who I'll reach out to and they'll read my script and I'm like, man, I really want them to like it. And so there are times when I get more sad about certain people when I get rejected by them Mm -hmm. or like big people in the Christian faith world, you know, it's like, but at least I'm getting rejected by those people. That's a good thing because at least they're like reading my work and they know my name now that that's been a, a really a blessing And, um, but I will say this. So if I get a rejection, that makes me really sad. I do sometimes like cry and then I'll try to like listen to worship music and pray about it. And then God usually like speaks to me and comforts me or whatever, but then he he probably reminds you of what's really important. (laughs) (laughs) He says a lot of things I'm sure like, you know, but like, (laughs) I mean, I sometimes write it down because it's a lot, but the important thing is though, just the next day, you just try to keep writing And sometimes it's nice to balance it. Like you could do like 30 minutes of emails to producers and then try to write, you know, at least like another 30 minutes or however long you have, Mm -hmm. but it's it's all about the balance and it is all about the big picture, which I try to keep in mind. 
sometimes it's just harder than others, you mm-hmm. know? Well, I have a, I have a question I'm dying to ask you and, and, you know, the, the dream right now for anybody who's in this industry is, you know, getting something on Netflix, right? That's the big thing, right? That's kind of the, <laughs> the bench of success, quote unquote, for most people in the industry. So what was it like seeing your name on the screen on Netflix? What was that like the first time you saw it? Oh, uh, well, the funny part is it was hard to see because you know how like it gets so <laughs> small at the end. You're like, wait, got to click in to watch the because I'm not at the beginning of the film because I'm a smaller sure. writer. Sure. I'm at the end. So then I had to just like click back into it to like watch the um, I, I, I guess it was anticlimactic. <laughs> I don't know. I'm not sure. I, I mean, like, I think for me, I know, like they say, you know, movie theaters are dead. But for me, I feel like it'll mean a lot more when I'm in the movie theater. I, I don't know. But um, but, you know, I think it'll mean more, too, when it's like my own project that gotcha. gets made, which I'm still working towards. Um, no, but I mean, look, I'm very grateful for the exposure because right. even just being able to say that really helped my networking back in 2019. Sure, and that's sure. when I was starting to really focus on like the LinkedIn networking. And mm-hmm. that helped me get a lot more reads on my scripts. And like well, I said, it, that query letter. <laughs> it, it provides a level of legitimacy that you really can't get any anywhere else as quick, right? You know, you can't yeah. really... So, so that's a, that's a huge thing. So talk a little bit about, about branding yourself that, and, and kind of let people know what that is. You and I know what that is, but some of our listeners or watchers might not. So talk a little bit about branding yourself and some steps that people might take uh, to help refine their branding. Yeah. Well, and you're talking, cause it's not just writers. It's like all different types, right? Yeah, it, well, could, it could be it could be applicable to pretty much any any world, but you can speak specifically to writers. That's fine. Well, in either way, I do think um, with LinkedIn, you know, for a long time, I said, well, I really believe in my LinkedIn method, but it hasn't led to work. But now I could say it has led to work. Mm-hmm. So I definitely think, you know, I'm not the best at like, I don't do Instagram. I don't, yeah, I do Facebook, you know, but I'm not the best at all of that social media. But with LinkedIn, I think it's really important that you do have your like he- headline or tagline. Make sure it says what you're most passionate about. You know, there's a lot of people that are writer directors and cinematographers, and that's great because if you can produce your own work, that's very valuable. But the only thing I will say, maybe if you're meant to be a writer specifically, is try to focus and get better at that. Um, And then in that genre or in writing, I think you should try to find the genre that fits you best that you love because Mm -hmm. Hollywood does love to brand you. So like if I do start having more success as a faith based writer, it would be hard for me to break out. But I'm okay with that because I love writing. paper. So like I'm okay with that, but make sure it's something you really love and that you're good at. Um, But I do think if you can focus, like maybe if you're a really good DP and, and you maybe writing's not your thing, but you want to direct, maybe just focus on directing and DPing. I don't know. It's hard. Cause then you probably have to write your own material. But all I can say is like, the more you can focus yourself for Hollywood, the better, because I have, you know, a lot of people I've reached out to who want to read my work because they're like, I love faith-based, you know, maybe I get more percentage than most. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Mm-hmm. I think with LinkedIn, I probably got a lot more contacts because I was specific with faith-based Right. So like, and then at least if people are interested in that, they don't have to connect to me, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah. yeah. Um, but so I just think in general, okay. And I have had big producers say, don't call yourself a faith-based writer because then like other producers won't want to work with you. Right. Um, but for me, I think it's only been a positive thing. So I, and- I, I think I agree with you. And I, I think, for me, for instance, you know, it would be it would be a nightmare to be somehow trapped in a world where I only got to write romance all the time, right? I just that's not my genre, right? Give, I need a monster or a sci-fi or something in my world to make me happy, and so, um, uh, so yeah, I, I think you're spot on. You know, get really really good at something and make sure it's something you're passionate about doing it because if you get good at it and then you get hired to go do it, you're going to have to do it all the time. So you better make sure it's something you enjoy. So yeah, yeah. I think that's spot on. So we're kind of at our uh, 45 minute mark. So I would love it, Kimberly, if you could maybe let folks know about maybe something new you've got coming out that you're excited about or where they can connect with you on uh, any uh, of the social medias that you might be on, you know, let people know where they can reach out and connect if, uh, if you want them to, or if not, if you want to be like, you know, 
uh, you know, just run off into the woods and say, never talk to me. That's fine too. So no, definitely. Um, they can definitely connect to me on, uh, LinkedIn. So it's just Kimberly Jade Solomon, like J A D E and Facebook too, if they want, it's under that for both. Those are the main socials I do. Um, and then they can always reach out to you. If anyone has any more questions, you can feel free to pass them on the okay. email if you want. Um, and then, well, my other emails on there so they can, and I'm on IMDb pro. Um, so if they want to, but you do have to pay to get the emails, you know, it's right. like 150 a year, but I think it's worth it, but they can definitely reach out to me through there. Um, and then, yeah, what I'm excited about two things I'm working on. One is a um, survival drama with, oh. about disabilities. So it's, it's a script I'm finishing up this next month and we will be sending it out to producers. It's one of the first ones too, where it's lighter faith. Um, it's a little more mainstream, but mostly just because that's just how it happened. You know, I, I wanted more faith in there, but it's just a little, it just didn't work out innately and I don't want to force it, right. but it is, um, you know, it has a lot of obviously Christian themes and it is about the disabilities, which I love um, because my husband's disabled as well. So it's a little bit inspired by his disability, Okay. but um, it's essentially like a disabled veteran uh, is um, trying to connect to his teenage daughter, who's a pacifist. You know, he recently lost his wife. So they're just really struggling with the two of them. So he takes her on a ski trip, but on the way there, they get veered off the road by an avalanche. So he has to kind of fight through his own disability, his pain, his self-doubt, and help. they have to work together to get to safety. Um, so that's one that we'll be sending out soon. So I'm excited. But the positive thing about it not being so faith-based is that my agent is going to send it to a lot bigger pool of people. So that's exciting. So we'll see how that goes. And then I won't get into all the details, but I'm writing a TV pilot on spec. Oh, cool. And um, I've only recently started doing more TV, but it's essentially a strong faith um, pilot about a detective who uses a little bit of like supernatural elements with her faith to solve Very crimes. Cool. So yeah, I'm excited about that. And, Is that um, one already attached to a studio or you said you're writing no, it on a spec? Just, that, yeah, I'm just writing that one um, on my own. Yeah, for free right now. But um. I'm, you know, eventually my agent will send that out too. And I might send some queries. I'm going to have to find different people because I focus on features so long, Right. but right. Um, I'm trying to get better at writing TV as well. It's, I haven't tried to write TV for a little while. So it's a totally yeah. different beast. It's a totally yeah. different beast. <laughs> but I'm excited. I'm hoping to find like an independent faith producer, maybe. So maybe even doing it lower budget. You yeah. Know. Well, well, drop me an email when you get it done. I might know some folks. So maybe, okay. I, can, maybe I can connect you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank yeah, you. Absolutely. I'll keep you posted. I'm excited about it for sure. <laughs> awesome. Well, we're excited that you were on the podcast with us today, Kimberly, and learned a ton. And, uh, and I think we could probably learn, learn a ton as well in the future if we have you back on. If you'd be interested, we'd love to have you back on at some point. Definitely. Let me know, especially right. if you want more like networking tips and things like that. That's where I shine. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Start okay. building, get that, dust that list off and we'll do that on the next podcast. <laughs> okay. Sounds great. Thank all you right, well, so much for yeah, having me. Absolutely. I'd love to close this in prayer if that's all right. Absolutely. All right, let's do it. Let's, let's go talk to dad. Glorious <laughs> heavenly father. We just come before you uh, praising your name, thanking you so much for being the creator God and uh, the God who made us and made it all, who made all things um, before the foundations of the universe and before time existed. And Father, we thank you for showing us a little insight into what it's like to be creative through your nature. Uh, we pray, Father, that we utilize our gifts, our skills, our talents, our blessings. Um, we, we pray that we use them in a way that brings you glory and points people to your son and to the truth of his crucifixion and the salvation that that brings. Now, Father, I pray your blessings on Kimberly and on her family, on her husband, and on all the efforts of her hands. And I pray that you prosper her as you would see fit, Father, and that um, you guide her uh, and you bring her to the people that you would have her to work with, the producers and the directors and the DPs and the, the studio heads. Father, you would, you, you would lay the path before her and that you would uh, let her know that they're in no uncertain terms, Father, exactly which steps to take. And uh, protect her father and guard her um, in the space where she is in. We praise you for her and her taking a stand. And I know, Father, that she pleases your heart um, as, a, as a daughter 
uh, as a proud father looking upon a daughter who is doing a great job. And so um, we thank you for the provision that you provided uh, for her up to this point. And we pray that if it be your will, you continue. Uh, we thank you for this technology that connects us today, Father. And I thank you for Kimberly and her smile and her spirit. And I just uh, pray, Father, that uh, all those who are listening or who are watching were blessed by this today and that they will learn something and that they too will utilize the unique ways that you made them so that they can um, raise high the banner of Christ. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Amen. <laughs> all right, my sister. Well, thank you again so much for being on. It was a pleasure. I had so much fun. Thank you very <laughs> good. much. <laughs> good. good. I'm glad. And to everybody out there who is listening uh, in Theophany Media Land uh, on the internet and uh, on the podcasts out there, please uh, like us and share us and comment and uh, rate us if you're on a podcast app. Let us know how we're doing. Um, and we'll be back soon. This again is Brandon signing off for Creatively Christian. Uh, you guys be blessed. Talk to you soon. Thank you so much for listening today. To find all the links and resources that were mentioned in today's episode, be sure and visit our website at theophanymedia.com forward slash Kimberly. To support the show and join our patron community where you'll get extra access and exclusive content, visit us at patreon.com forward slash creatively Christian. Creatively Christian is a product of Theophany Media. You can find out more at theophanymedia.com. This show is hosted by Brandon Hollingsworth, Andrea Sandifer, Dave Ebert, and Rachel Anna. Our logo is by Bill Brooks. Bill Brooks and Andrea Sandifer did our music, and Jake Dobrins produces and edits the show.